Sales Real Estate Show, my little TV behind me here, uh, wanted to do a software update. And <laughs> I thought, okay, what the heck, I'll do that. It's only going to take about 30 seconds. And, you know, I usually have a picture back there or something. So I'm going to mess with it live here so that it doesn't look as crummy as it does. And let's go down here to HDMI 3. See, isn't this fun about going live? And uh, let me see if I could put something interesting up there. It was spinning like crazy and driving me absolutely bonkers. So we're going to just roll this over there and call it a day. How's that? That's better than what I was staring at the past few minutes. <laughs> oh, man. Well, good morning and welcome. Welcome again to the uh, Rick Helps Real Estate Show. We try to make sense of this crazy Arizona market. And then we also try to make sense of our TVs. So I'm going to have to pull this over here again. And uh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to just turn the doggone thing off. So I'm not going to mess with it. Good morning, Kellogg from Albania this morning. And also, Soy G TJ, good morning. So what's going on in the market? We're going to talk a little bit about how rates are moving just a little bit right now. Good morning, Stephanie. And uh, show you, it was actually a really brisk weekend out there in the real estate market. It's starting to show up in the numbers. And here's the... Here's the mortgages right now, kind of, uh, they were trending a little negative. Now they're kind of heading back minimal. Um, as you can see, the, that's the mortgage-backed securities and treasuries market. And if I refresh it here, it's heading more towards, doesn't look like it's going to be much of a volatile day. Just kind of, kind of hang in there. We're sitting there at 9.5, 6.54, 9. Oh my God, I went back to the 90s there for a moment. 6.54 for 30-year fix, that's on an average. And what we've seen in the market is if I pull up my seven-day moving average, and this is one that I think is a little closer to the market that you can get, but look at how under contract went up significantly. It's up 3,281, almost 3,300 homes. And we were you know, sitting around here around 3,100 homes over a seven-day average. And then new listings kind of crept back just a hair. So the gap is getting smaller. And what, the reason I mentioned the gap is the gap's tight. It puts upward pricing pressure on homes. If the gap grows, then uh, prices come down. And you can see here, listings under contract really started taking off <coughs> at the first of the year. And uh, I'm going to show you some other numbers looking at our local regional data here. And I, most of us use the Cromford report because it's got more data than we can get. Uh, they pull it all off the MLS and do the hard work, heavy lifting for us. But you can see that we've got a bit of an up and down here on listings under contract, but they uh, they haven't slid down the past three weeks. And then monthly average sales price per square foot. Now, the thing to remember about the sales price is that the sales price here in January, see how it's way down here? Well, those are contracts that were written in December. So there's always a 30 to 45 day lag. So if you're looking at listings under contract here, you can see in December, they went way down, right? Well, that was reflected in the price decrease in January. And that's kind of been uh, our bottom right now for what we're looking at. And you're seeing here how they've climbed up and they have risen slightly in the past week. So that's not bad news for sellers. And this is the Case Schiller index it's a month over month seasonally adjusted index and look at this it's showing everything is down well, why is that it's showing you january it lags about two months sometimes three months but usually two months so you're seeing here that their case shiller index and this gets a lot of news so you'll start seeing this in the news real estate is down and then you go back and go well yes it was it was down in january and it's reflected in this number so we won't see February, March numbers until around May. So keep that in mind as you see some of those numbers roll out. And then if you look at sales per month, you know, a lot of this is seasonal right now. We're starting to increase. We're here at uh, 52.36 for March and 53.87 for February. So we'll surpass that here. We're, we're clipping along pretty good. It's nowhere near uh, dire straits, but uh, it's, it's not way down here. So once again, my red pen says, well, Rick, you got to restart me. 
um, we can't uh, we can't work without that. So, and I'm not going to do that right now. <laughs> Pending listings, Pending listings went up, and uh, this has been a very good week for real estate. If you're a seller, um, I was mentioning yesterday. I know a guy was in Tempe was talking about how many homes he had on his list and how shocked he was and how many went under contract as fast as they did. And uh, now by no means am I saying, here we go, off we go. The market's going to be brisk. Away we go. Happiness for everybody. Real estate agents like it when prices go up. Most real estate agents don't really give a rip whether prices are going up or going down. We just want to manage through the transaction. We just want it to close. Uh, prices going up or going down really don't have any impact on uh, on our business. Some people do really well during uh, periods of high foreclosures and short sales. Some agents, that's their niche. They go out and help banks with that and they, they go like crazy. Some people concentrate on the high end market and there is some pullback uh, tightening and financing for jumbo mortgages that may start to affect that. But it has more to do with banking than it does with uh, prices. So um, while the market is trending up right now, um, there are some headwinds in banking, uh, but uh, hard to tell how hard that's going to hit or if that's going to get worse or if that's going to get better. So if you're a seller, I would take comfort in knowing that it's not quite the struggle to sell a home right now as it was in November and December. So it is active enough for you to get your home sold. What's it going to be like in April and May? Well, April looks like it's going to be pretty steady. And May, we'll just have to wait and see. Now, we do um, follow Barry Habib a lot on this channel. He's been uh, quite accurate in predicting mortgage rates. And he's he's predicting a huge, colossal dip on May 10th. And uh, we're trying to get him on the show here. So I pass that torch to Pat. This here is an article on Housing Wire. And it talked about what I just mentioned on jumbo loans. And it says, unlike conforming loans, which are largely financed through mortgage-backed securities and vid cap via capital markets, the jumbo mortgage space is almost entirely funded via the banking sector. And some regional banks are more concentrated in jumbo mortgages than others. Ongoing liquidity stress could limit home financing and therefore sales in the related market segments and geographies with high concentration, the group noted, jumbo loans account for about 12% of loans. So after all that jumbo jumbo, what they're saying is construction activity may also be hampered as construction and development loans for single family home construction are heavily financed by regional banks. That's something to keep in mind. The home construction gets their money from these large regional banks. So if there is a tightening, they're going to feel it there and there goes the expansion. Hmm. Wonder whether the correlations or regressions on impact of potential market seasonality compared to other variables and constants. Um, I kind of like how the Cromford report kind of meshes through seasonality. I mean, I, there's actually a chart here, Stephanie, I could, I could pull up. Saul, I wish you could comment on the Tucson market. I don't have any data from there, but it has been closely mirroring uh, what we have here. If I look at my uh, analysis here. Let me see if they have seasonality. I think they they did, um, and I don't want to bore everybody while I... Well, here it is. It says seasonal trends, um, closed sales. So pulled up a chart yesterday, and it was pretty doggone busy. Most of you probably still have a headache from that one. Here we are. So this is... Uh, <laughs> only goes to December, though. So that's not, that's not telling me a whole lot. Let's see what else it comes out and does. Seasonal trends... New listings. Let's go there and see what's going on. Um, and that's showing me December. Well, that's worthless. <laughs> Sorry, Crumford. I usually don't beat you up, but that's not helping me with anything. Um, March, April, May in Arizona is usually the beginning of a busier market. Surprisingly enough, we get very busy in June because, again, people want to move the kiddos before school starts. And our schools, believe it or not, start here about the third week of July. And uh, then they have a two-week break in October. Uh, they call it fall break. So you get to get them into the classrooms and let them pay for the air conditioning instead of home. So um, I'll see what else I can pull up there, Stephanie, and see if I can 
see some seasonality. But if if we look, here's what a normal market looks like in Arizona. January is when we see the most new listings. February is when we see the most price reduction because everybody's optimistic in January. Here we go, new year. And then they go, oh, the house didn't sell. We got to reduce the price. Then you get March. March tends to level out a little bit on pricing and activity starts to pick up. And it has to do with just people getting ready for the spring market. And that's the same nationally. We're the only one that sees an increase in new listings in January in, this, in the nation because we don't have snow. So then you have slight increases coming into April and May. And then you get a pretty some pretty brisk movement in June. July and August tends to slow down, yada, yada, yada. So I think uh, I think we're starting to see some of that now. And we're seeing it, I think, at a uh, brisker rate than I anticipated as I was looking at uh, sales and going through the seven-day moving average. And just based on how I was feeling it in the market, I said, wow, it's uh, surprisingly good. Um, that's uh, much to the dismay of the crashers that are out there. And I also looked up some open door numbers. You can see numbers down there below. Look, they're only down to 350 homes and they have 320 pending right now. So they're selling about 300 a month. They're not buying a lot. I think they bought 45 homes last month. So they're trying to get their ducks in a row. They're in even deeper trouble in other states than here. I think in Tennessee, they, they're in Texas. They've got a lot of inventory, but take a look at that stock price. It was trading at $35 a share back in February. And today it's a buck 54. Offer pad is worse. Offer pads down to 54 cents. And I think they got a letter saying they're going to be relisted. So as they shake all this out, what's the new product going to look like? What is the new iBuyer going to be? Are they going to go back to resorting to the convenience with the really high fees? Remember when they first came out, they didn't have commissions. They have fees. And uh, so they were as high as 7%. And then they came in and hit you with a pretty good uh, list of repairs that they needed to do. And they wanted you to give them a credit, sometimes ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. They made their margins off the fees. So they were making their profit margin off the fees, but even still, they were losing money. So they were making this money, 7%, and then they were relisting the home after fixing it up a little bit, and they were still losing money. So it's no wonder they're losing their shorts today, but what's their new model going to look like? And the only reason in this industry that we talk about it is just, it's interesting to follow. There was a point there, it was kind of affecting values in certain areas, but uh you know, their goal, especially in partnering with Zillow now, is to do like one-stop shopping. They are both trying to build a model where you can say, oh, I found my home. Oh, look, the loan is right here. I get to pick a title company right here. And I get to find a, a mover and everything's done with the click of a mouse. This is fabulous. But the industry is not as integrated as people think it is. And there's also some compliance issues when it comes to just saying, here's our title company. So you don't want to get to where, you know, you only have one grocery store in town. So housing's the same way. You don't want to, you don't want to make it drift that way. I work for Nacho Brothers. Am I saying that right? Uh, we develop a, a lot of land for new homes. Sure hope we keep working. You know, the construction industry right now is very optimistic about next year. Um, and if you look at their stock prices, most of them are going up. If I just take a quick peek here at, uh, uh, let's see, Pulte, Pulte Group, uh, they're up 1.3% uh, today. So um, there's not a lot of pessimism going on as far as building going forward because they kind of backed off at the right time, despite some of the videos that you've seen out there that go, look at all these houses. If you look at the actual numbers, uh, when things started going south, they stopped. They pulled back. So they're managing their inventory a lot better now than they did back in 2006, 2007. Back then, if there was an open plot of land, they put a house on it because somebody was dumb enough to buy it. And uh, so right now, not seeing that. So it's comforting to watch. Um, it's the, the banking jitters are not comforting to watch. So I'm watching that closely, as close as I can. I'm just a guy flying over at 30,000 feet. Uh, but, you know, the... 
Fed is doing everything they can, and so is the Treasury, with experimenting to keep these things from collapsing. And it's always just an experiment. I mean, they don't have anything that says, oh, last time that happened, we did this. So they're winging it. And it's never good when they're winging it. And we got to see what happens. Is there going to be a recession? Well, the, the numbers are showing yes. But remember, a recession is primary. And they're saying in order to get inflation down, we're going to have to have a pretty pretty good inflation. But maybe not. Um, if you look at Barry Habib, he's saying, you watch. Uh, May, June, July, inflation numbers are going to be really low. Um, and that's just based on year-over-year -year projections. But recessions just mean that your GDP contracted by um, uh, three quarters in a row or two quarters in a row. We already had a little bit of that this year. It doesn't mean rampant job losses, foreclosures, and despair. Despite some people wanting that to happen, it means a contraction in the economy. How severe it is? All depends. We see those all the time. You usually see some type of... Uh, roll back about every seven years, but we've been on a tear here for quite some time and spending money like a drunken sailor. So we're, we've got a lot going on out in the market. And uh, so as we look toward, now we find ourselves in holding patterns, waiting to see what the Fed's going to do. And then we see what they're going to do. The market adjusts. Then we're waiting, waiting to see what the Fed's going to do. Then we adjust. Welcome to today's real estate market. Uh, that would be pretty neat to have Barry on the show. We are trying I don't know if it's going to cost me anything or not, Keenan. We are, we are looking, and uh, I'm putting a lot of pressure on Pat. Pat, call your buddy, get him on the show, and uh, he's he's pretty hard to get. So if I score that, that's going to be a biggie, and we better hurry up with that. I want to, I want to talk with him soon. So maybe he's watching. I doubt it. Hope everybody has a great day. Take on the day and have a fabulous rest of the week. If I don't see you here, be back on tomorrow morning. Take care.